Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Phil Richards. In today's video we're going to be talking about testing passive range of motion of the shoulder joint, or the glenohumeral joint to be more exact. So the purpose of testing passive range of motion is to see what happens when the active contractile element is not involved in the patient's movement. If you're not familiar with why we test passive range of motion, we suggest you check out our video titled Why We Test Passive Range of Motion for the full clinical reasoning process behind why we do what we do. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the affected and unaffected sides, but of course in practice we always want you to compare the two so you can inform your patient's diagnosis. So when we're thinking about testing passive range of motion, we need to consider three things. Pain, range, and end feel. Okay, that's it. Let's get to our main video. Let's get clinical. So now we're going to test passive shoulder flexion. So as a therapist, we're going to stand on the side of the arm, the shoulder being tested. Our patient is going to be supine relaxed, and it's a good idea to ask them to shuffle over so they're more towards you so you can access their shoulder better. In terms of our handling, we're going to get one hand around the wrist, gently cradling here, and our other hand scooping under, you'll be able to see as we lift up here, underneath the elbow. From here, we're going to use a lunge stance and bring the arm up. And when we get to about this position, what we can do is just rest the patient's arm against our body so it feels a bit more comfortable and they can relax a bit more. And then from there, we just progressively take the arm further and further up into shoulder flexion. And we go to the end of available range, depending on the end feel, the limit of the joint or pain limiting. So when you start off with shoulder flexion, um, it's likely that you're going to be very frustrated with it. And the reason is, is that when a person has pain in their shoulder, they don't appreciate anyone else picking their arm up and moving it around. So if that is the case and you find your patient is very apprehensive about you moving their shoulder, what you can do is break it down and try and support it with as much as your body as possible. What does that mean? Let's say I have Polly's shoulder here and I get about this far, and I find that the patient's very resistant, they don't want to let go. What I can do from here is really come in and hug the arm and see if that allows me to come up into that range and see if it's more apprehension that's stopping me go further. If we can get a bit further, we can change our handling round a little bit more and just get in, just support it against your thorax and you can move it a bit more there. And if they're still not able to tolerate that, then you can end the test there and just document your findings. So let's talk about what we're looking for. So we're looking for pain, range, and end feel. So in terms of pain, if we have pain when we're doing this movement, we're expecting it to be a non-contractile structure that's at fault. If it is contractile related, it's only going to be from a passive lengthening on the opposite side. So for instance, in this motion, you can see that we're passively lengthening the triceps. So that could be a consideration for pain. But because we're not actively using the shoulder flexors, if it is painful, we're thinking about something articular that's at fault, either the joint, the joint capsule, the various ligaments. In terms of the range, we're expecting 165 degrees and we're expecting a harder end feel as we get to the end of the joint. So let's think about some more general pathologies with this. If we have a very typical grotty rotator cuff strain to the fact to the point where it's actually torn, we're likely to not have any pain whatsoever as we come up passively because the muscles aren't actively involved and it may be very, very easy and surprising to the patient that we can do this movement without eliciting pain. You can match this with your active movements where it probably will be painful and a reduced range. Let's consider something like an osteoarthritic condition. If the joint capsule has got quite stiff, then you'll find that once you start getting past the, depending on the severity of the disease process, past 90, more sort of 110, 120 degrees, you're gonna find an abnormal hard end feel. 
which is from the joint capsule being super, super tight, and you may find that this elicits pain at the end range. And finally, if we consider something like a more regular muscle strain, a deltoid strain, rotator cuff strain, similarly to the tear, we're not expecting any pain on our passive movements, or at least very, very reduced pain relative to other things because we've taken that active contractile element out of the picture. So now we're going to test passive shoulder abduction. As a therapist, we're going to stand on the same side of the shoulder being tested, so it's this one here. And our patient is going to be supine relaxed and preferably wiggled over to the side that we're working from so we can access the shoulder more easily. In terms of our handling, we're going to bend the elbow up to 90 degrees flexion. And from here, with one hand, we're going to scoop under and cradle the elbow softly. We're going to bring it into slight abduction to start. Then we're going to get the patient to just pop their hand on the side here. And we're going to trap it with our arm so that when we lift out, it doesn't end up just flopping around. <laughs> now, this other hand here is going to come onto the anterior aspect of the shoulder joint. And we're just it's just going to be a feeling hand for what's going on. So right now, I can feel on Polly that her elbow, her humeral head, um, I've left this in far too much extension. So the humeral head's actually already riding too far anterior. So if I was to abduct Polly now, I'm probably going to impinge it. So this is really useful to have this feeling hand. So now I know if I lift the shoulder up, sorry, the elbow up a little bit more into relative flexion, I know I've got that hem humeral head now centered. So this is where I want to work from, from neutral. So from here, we're going to walk with our feet and bring the arm up into abduction. And we're going to go as far as we can unless there's a pain response or we get to the end of available range. And for Polly here, I would say it's about here and then we'd stop the test. So when we're doing passive testing, we want to think about three things. We want to think about pain, range, and end feel. So if we think very broadly about pain, we know that with passive testing, we've tried to eliminate the active contractile element as much as possible. So this means the muscle strains, the rotator cuff strains, are not likely to be as painful or absent of pain when we do the test, unless it's very, very hyperacute. You will still see some irritation if things are very, very hyperacute. So now if we think about things where the joint capsule uh, is jammed or the joint is limited. So we're thinking very classically of our osteoarthritis and our frozen shoulder types. So what we're going to experience there, again, if we get in position, is as we come up, we're going to get to a point um, which typically can range from sort of 80 degrees abduction upwards, depending on the disease progression. We're going to hit a very hard end feel because of either restricted joint capsule or the way that the arthritis has developed not allowing movement to happen anymore. And this is likely to cause pain at the end range. So they're the two, my, uh, two main categories I'd like you to consider when we're doing the passive testing. So now we're going to move on to testing passive range of motion of the glenohumeral joint into internal and external rotation. So as a therapist, we're going to stand on the same side of the shoulder being tested. Our patient is going to be supine, comfortably relaxed, preferably we're brought over to the side of the bed where we are so we can access the shoulder better. We're going to start from a 90 degrees abduction. So we're going to get one hand and cup under the elbow and the other hand supporting the wrist. And we're going to bring the shoulder out into 90 degrees abduction. If we're not able to get this far uh, for typical reasons such as pain, then we can always do it from lower down, but this is the preferred optimal position. So from here, let's say we want to look at external rotation. We're going to get one hand and cup under the elbow, and the other hand here, this is going to be the hand that's doing the moving. This is our supporting hand, and this is the one that's going to provide the external rotation. And we simply guide it back. It's more of a guide down than a push. Please don't 
push into external rotation, it doesn't feel very nice. So we're going to guide it slowly down until we get to our end of range. Once we've found the end of range, we can return it back up. The exact opposite operation is required for internal rotation. So instead of this hand here cupping under, we're going to use the opposite hand here. And this hand is going to come around this way so we can use the arm like a lever. And this time we're going to drop down this way into internal rotation. And again, we get to the end point and then we can bring the patient back and return the arm down. So let's consider our pain, range, and end feel. Let's talk about pain. So when we're doing passive movements, we're trying to remove the active contractile element out of the equation. So theoretically, when we're performing the passive movement, we shouldn't get pain if it's a muscular lesion, unless it's being passively stretched. However, with passive internal external rotation, if the shoulder, if the muscles of the shoulder are sufficiently irritated, you won't get pain through range, but you may find that you have a reduction in range and a pain at the end feel, but it will feel very much elastic and it will also vary. If you keep repeating to test the end feel, you're going to find that it will kind of let go, not let go, let go, not let go. This gives you a really good idea that actually it's the hypertonicity of the muscles that's restricting this. So that's not a classic behavior, but it's still worth remembering because you're going to see it quite a lot. Conversely, if we think about our osteoarthritic group or our frozen shoulder group, then we're going to get pain and we're going to get pain at the end range. It's going to be a restricted end range and it's going to be due to a loss of joint space or a tight joint capsule. So we might get to say here, and because lateral rotation is very often lost in a frozen shoulder and osteoarthritis, and it's gonna be very hard and it might be painful at the end as we're jamming the joint. But thinking not about jammed joints, let's talk about the normal range. So in terms of our external rotation, we'd expect to get to around 100 degrees. So let's see what Polly's got today. So I would say we're about 90 and that feels a bit tight, but I would say that's still within a normal value. And in terms of our internal rotation, we're expecting around the 70 mark. And we can see for Polly, actually we're more down towards 90. So we know that she's got an element of hypermobility in the shoulder. The expected end feel for these is an elastic end feel because it's the joint capsules that's being stretched, which brings me beautifully to my next point actually. So when we come into external rotation here, we're opening up the front of the shoulder. So it's the anterior capsule that's under stress. So this could be another reason for our patient's pain. If we get to the end and it feels like a relatively normal end feel, but it's causing them pain, it could be the anterior capsule. Conversely, when we come down into internal rotation here, we're stressing more of the posterior capsule. So if we're getting pain at the end here, it could be that the posterior capsule is too tight or irritated, and that's the source of our patient's problem. So you may have noticed that we haven't done our passive range of motion testing of the glenohumeral joint into adduction or extension. And there's uh, reasons for this. So if we think about the adduction, this is normally covered with the scarf test. This is a horizontal adduction special test where we get the patient to bend the elbow and we simply take the arm across. And this can be done in varying degrees of flexion. So this will be covered in a different video. With regards to passive shoulder extension, this isn't routinely tested, but of course, if you feel it's important based on your patient history and presentation, you can add it in. And simply all you need to do is with the patient supine is ask them to wiggle themselves to the edge of the bed so that their arm can comfortably hang off. You can guide it down and applied some gentle pressure to get your end feel. So let's summarize this video on passive range of movement of the shoulder joint. First, complete your passive range of movement with the patient in a supine position. When completing your passive tests, be aware of your handling for each movement and make sure to compare the affected and unaffected sites. Test passive flexion, abduction, internal and external rotation. 
Optionally, you can also test passive adduction or extension. When completing your tests, make a note of pain, range and end feel. And that concludes our video on passive range of motion testing for the shoulder. From here, what we suggest is you compare your passive range of motion findings with your active range of motion findings to see if it's more likely that a non-contractile or a contractile lesion is causing your patient's condition. And this, alongside your other tests, will form your patient diagnosis. If you're not familiar with why we test active range of motion and passive range of motion, we suggest you check out our videos titled Why Test Active Range of Motion and Why Test Passive Range of Motion for the full clinical reasoning process behind why we do what we do. Guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again soon on Clinical Physio.